Today I'm going to be talking about our Energy Cultures uh, project, which is a three-year interdisciplinary research project. But before I start, I'd just like to begin with a little story about the elephant and the blind men. And um, you might know this story. If you do, just indulge me for, for a few minutes. So the story is that uh, one day a group of blind men happen upon this elephant, and they feel the elephant to, to try and learn what it's like. And each one feels a different part of its body. So one feels his tail, another feels his belly, the third one feels his trunk, and so on. And they compare notes, and they find that they're in complete disagreement about what the elephant's like. The one that's felt his tail says, oh, I know, an elephant is just like a rope. The one that's felt the belly says, no, you're completely wrong. The elephant, he's like a, he's like a wall. And the third one that's felt the trunk says, no, you're both wrong. What he's actually like is a tree branch. So coming back to the problem that we're talking about, if behavior or energy-related behavior changes our elephant, we wanted to make sure that we're actually seeing the whole problem. And that's why we really felt the need for interdisciplinarity in our research. So let me introduce the research team. The original research team, when they started out in 2009, was comprised of five different uh, members of staff that each brought a different range of skills and perspectives to the table. So we had um, economics, oh, sorry, physics, economics, uh, human geography, sociology, psychology, and law and policy. And our team is growing, so I joined the team last year, and my background is engineering. Uh, we also have a coordinator, postdoctoral students, and summer students. Um, so quickly, my talk outline. I'm first going to talk about our motivations and give you a little bit idea of the New Zealand context. Look at how we've used our framework um, to design our research. And, oh, sorry, I'm going to introduce the framework first and then look at how we've used it to design our research. Um, I'm going to focus in on one part of the research, which is our household surveys, and talk about a few insights from that. And then I'm going to talk about the next steps and how we're going to bring this all together to move forwards. Um, so first of all, in New Zealand, our residential lifestyles are very inefficient. Um, and largely, amongst other issues, this is really due to the poor quality and um, poor insulation quality of our housing stock. And so for us, as well as consumption, consumer energy efficiency is a, is a big issue. It's a very attractive goal. Um, but it's not proving easy to achieve. And, and the uptake of these sort of technologies and practices, the insulation material, is far behind what just a simple cost-benefit analysis suggests. And so the research team really felt a need to incorporate systems and behavioral um, thinking into our approach. We realized it's a very complex system with lots of actors and moving parts and that there was not going to be a single magic bullet. So our objective was to try and characterize these individual and household behaviors in light of the wide range of dynamics that we're acting. And so to do this, we developed um, a conceptual framework to try and assist us in understanding these factors influencing consumption, um, to help us identify opportunities for behavior change, and also to create a common language for us, the research team, to talk to one another in. Um, we took a cultures approach, and we also drew from lifestyle and systems thinking, and um, Rick, you highlighted so nicely this morning how there are so many interpretations of behavior. So a real key part of the framework was the ability to consider the different characterizations of, of behavior um, across all the different disciplines. So we can sometimes see this referred to as the material culture of, of the individual and household. So coming back to my home heating um, issue, which is so big in New Zealand, this might be things like, what is the insulation of my household? What are the heating devices? Um, we can also think about it in terms of our cognitive norms. So by this, we might think about expected comfort levels. And we can also think about our practices. So things like um, how long I'm actually using my heating for and how many rooms I'm heating, as well as the interrelation of all of these, all of these aspects. We also appreciated that our actions aren't going on in a vacuum, and so we wanted to account for the contextual soup, so the wider range of dynamic processes that are influencing us and keeping us locked into these habits. So from our conceptual model, we can see that to change these energy-related behaviors and habits, we can't just change one part of the framework because our actions are embedded in the whole. So we actually need to get a shift of the entire framework to a new set of habits. So we set about developing a research question to probe the different parts of the framework. And we actually did this by performing six different research analysis, and these were led by either single or two members of the team. So if I just come back to the framework, um, the first methodology we looked at was values laddering, and this was looking at things like tying, for example, values and rationalizations to behavior and probing 
our cognitive norms and some of the links out. Um, our choice modeling then built on this, trying to look at people's preferences for different heating and hot water systems. Um, we conducted household surveys, which looked at each of the three pillars of the framework. We did a legal and policy analysis to look at the external influences. Focus groups, now we weren't really sure what we were gonna find in the focus groups, and we're actually in the process of analyzing these right now. Um, we did a social network analysis, um, and also we're, we're again in the process of drawing the results out of that now. But the idea was to start with this, this framework and to bring together each of these different findings, giving us a holistic view of our elephant and helping us to design our intervention. So today I'm gonna to focus on the household surveys and Rob Lawson, um, who came from a consumer psychology marketing background, led this piece of research. And I'm actually gonna talk about this rather than the aspects I'm more involved in for two reasons. One is that the bits I'm more involved in are still under analysis, but also it was Rob who Karen initially um, reached out to today. And um, unfortunately for personal reasons, he can't be here, but I felt it important to share his work. So um, our household surveys, recall they looked at these three pillars of the framework and we asked people around 300 questions to do with their house material, the age, the number of rooms they heat, their heating methods, um, appliance ownership, conservation methods, attitudes and belief, and so on. And we ended up with a nationally representative sample of about two and a half thousand people. And our hypothesis was that we would see distinctive clusters of energy cultures. And by this, we mean groups with similar um, material culture, cognitive norms, and energy practices. And in fact, this was the case. We found three clusters in our data, and this accounted for 91% of the data set. We only had 9% that were outliers. So our first group were conventional conservers. These guys were represented about 39%. They tended to be a bit older, over 55. A lot of them were retired. And they lived in older homes with more rooms, but their homes were comfy because they'd modified them to, to make them more energy efficient. And therefore, they were very satisfied with their homes. They planned to stay there for longer than 10 years. These guys tended to value tradition and obedience, and they didn't place as much emphasis on pleasure as some of the other clusters. And they were pretty keen on government schemes that helped households help themselves, um, much more than regulations or taxpayer incentives. Um, they were pretty aware of and practiced um, energy efficiency measures in their homes, so they turned their lights off when they left the room, they took shorter showers, they've turned the, water setting, uh, the heating settings on their hot water down. Um, but they were motivated more by pragmatism, not environmental concern. So their desire not to waste had really led to this energy efficient behavior. Um, and they didn't make purchases and upgrades that they saw as unnecessary. So for example, a lot of them still have VCRs instead of DVD players and so on. Our second group was the family consumers. These guys represented about 40% of the population. Um, they tended to be middle-aged with teenagers and they were, um, they were financially well off. A lot of them earned over 75 grand a year, but, and they lived in very big but inefficient homes. Um, they also only planned to stay in their homes for less than 10 years. And these guys were pretty well informed about environmental issues, um, but they were very motivated by egoistical values, so self-enhancement and pleasure. And they were a little bit cynical about the impact of their behavior on the environment, and they weren't taking too much responsibility. And in fact, we found that their practices reflected these values uh, with priorities more on comfort and convenience for their families. And they did say that they were interested in making energy efficient investments, but it wasn't their priority right now. Right now they were more focused um, with purchase of luxury items to, to enjoy life more. Um, and our third groups are basic users. These guys were about 21% of the population. They were younger, smaller, and poorer. So they were couples, flatters, and young families. Um, a lot of them earned less than 20 grand a year. This was accounted for by the fact that there were quite a few students in this group. 30% um, were immigrants to New Zealand, and a lot of them rented, and they only planned to stay in their home for one to three years. Um, they held seemingly contradictory values, so they had egoistic values of social recognition and intelligence, but at the same time, they wanted to be helpful and protect their environment. They didn't value obedience as much as the other, the other clusters, and they were less environmentally aware than them. Um, they also thought that our ecological issues could be, say, could be um, solved by technological solutions, and they were in support of government regulations to restrict harmful practices. But they do think that they, make, um, that they make good energy efficient choices where they can, but they say that they're pretty unempowered to make changes for a couple of reasons. One is that they're renting and they, or they might be moving soon. Another is that they say they're already doing a lot of these practices 
and they just can't afford to, to purchase new technologies or insulate their homes. They're financially unable to do this. So this data has given a little bit of context to our clusters. It's, it's helped us to identify some mechanisms by which we might be able to to encourage the shift in energy cultures. And we can see it's different for different groups. So our conventional conservers, these guys were calling out for, um, for better information to help them make their changes, and also performance standards so that their efforts are recognized. Um, whereas our basic users, their material culture was lacking. And I'd just like to illustrate the extent of this fee. So uh, in another piece of slightly unrelated research, um, sorry, slightly related research, we looked at temperatures in student houses in Dunedin. And in some of the houses, the temperature in the home was colder than the temperature in their refrigerators. So, <laughs> yeah, so perhaps we need to target landlords for these guys. Um, but, <laughs> I know. but um, so whilst this gave us a really good insight into the material culture, cognitive norms, and, and energy practices, it didn't account, this analysis hasn't accounted for the interactions that I spoke about, the contextual soup, or the multidisciplinary perspective. So what we're doing is we're combining this, these results with our other findings, integrating these to develop our intervention design. Um, it's quite different to what we thought it would be from this piece of analysis alone. We're still in the process of rolling it out, and we're going to be implementing it later this year. So I'd just like to end with a quote from Professor Alice Gottlieb. And it's, if you think of the if you think of disciplines like organs, that then interdisciplinarity is something like blood. It flows. It's a liquid. It's not contained. There's no inside or outside. Thank you very much. <laughs>